CC Rainfall and CC Snowfall are both underneath the simulation category. And let's just start with CC Rainfall. I'll apply this to a photo of this dock and it's a little hard to see, but we have some lines all throughout our image now that's a pretty good approximation of what rain looks like. So if I play this, you'll actually notice that it's animated and now it's very obvious to be able to see that drizzle. It's actually pretty convincing just with the default settings, but we have a lot of controls to shape this rain to look exactly how we want it. Let's take a look at the controls. I'll zoom into 100% and it's easiest to see in these points of contrast, but you can really tell that there's a lot of depth to this rain with bigger drops and smaller drops off in the distance. And that's why it's under the simulation category because technically this is a particle emitter working with actual 3D space. So let's pause that and take a look at the controls. The first option is drops. This is simply the rainfall count. So we could make it look like a just very slight sprinkle if we turn this down to say 700 and play this back, uh, or we could even crank that down to 100. And then it's just a couple of sprinkles every so often. And you could easily keyframe this to control rainfall beginning in a shot or in an animation. Let's reset that back to 5,000. The next setting is the size of the rain. So I could turn that up to make it a lot more noticeable. And as I do that, you can see that it is pretty soft and transparent, which obviously rain would look that way. If you've ever seen video of a rainstorm, it's actually really hard to see raindrops. And in movies or TV shows where they have to have rain, they use an insane amount of water dropping on top of the actors and they light it in the way so that it shows up really crystal clearly. So this effect does a pretty good job of replicating the way that rain would actually look. I'll reset that size back down to a default again. And the next control is the scene depth. And this actually might be a little bit hard to see on top of the photo. So what I'm going to do is just add a fill effect before the rainfall and just make it black so that we can really see those raindrops. And in fact, I'm gonna skip down to the opacity value real quick and just increase the opacity so it's much easier to see what's happening. Now, if I increase the scene depth, the rain is shifting around a lot, but what's really happening is that the individual layers and positioning of each one of these raindrops or particles is being spread out in the Z axis. So we're literally increasing the depth between raindrops. And if I scale this way back down, then it's gonna compress that Z axis until we just have this big jumbled mess of lines that kind of looks like it's all existing in one single plane. All right, let's reset that to defaults again. And I'll turn off that fill effect. Next, we have the speed. So if I turn this way, way down, so let's say maybe around 750 and play this back, that rain's gonna be falling at an unnatural rate. It pretty much looks like it's in slow motion. So I'll undo that, but I could also increase the speed and then it's gonna be coming down like with hurricane force winds, just a really crazy amount of rain. I'll reset that back to default. And then we take a look at the wind value. If I turn that up, it's very apparent what's happening. We're adding wind into this particle system and the rain is now coming down at an angle. And we could go in a negative value as well if we wanted to go the opposite direction. We also have the variation percentage for that wind. So we can make this look a lot more intense and chaotic with the direction of the wind and how that's affecting the raindrops. I'll turn that variation back down to zero. And then we have the spread value. I'll stop the playback for a second and turn up the spread. So instead of affecting the wind, this is just affecting the trajectory of each individual particle. So it's a similar effect to the variation of the wind, except this is a percentage of whatever value we've set right here except that this property is a percentage of whatever we've set the wind to. So it's influenced by it. Whereas the spread value is just a universal global value change for every single particle, regardless of the wind. So I could turn this down to zero and it's still gonna be going crazy. But if the spread was set to zero and my variation of the wind was turned all the way up, it doesn't affect it because it's a percentage of whatever I have the wind set to. All right, let's set those back down to zero and reset this back to its default value of six. And then we have the color value. By default, it's set to white, but we could change this to anything. If we wanted purple, pink rain, we could do that. And if we need it to be more intense, we could turn up the opacity. But I wanna pause here for a second and point out that every single raindrop has a different value. Some are brighter than others. And this actually has to do with the image that you're applying it to. It's pulling values from the pixels behind it to increase or decrease the value of the raindrops, which again is more similar to how actual rain would be interacting with light. 
And if we go to the next option of background reflection, this is where that effect is actually being controlled. So the influence percentage is set to 80 by default. But if I turn that all the way down, then we just have these bright magenta lines because that's the color I set it to and the opacity is set to 100. But background reflection is referring to what is behind the raindrops. So if I increase that influence back up to 80%, then we're basically tinting the pixels of the photo. And if I turn it all the way up to 100%, then we're ignoring the color that we've set here and pulling all of the color information strictly from the pixels behind the raindrops. And we have two other controls to modify how this is working too. We have spread width and spread height. And these values basically control the sampling area of the background image to be able to map the pixels values and colors to the raindrops. So if I turn the spread width and the spread height all the way down, then the colors are gonna be based very directly on what's behind those raindrops. But if I increase the spread width and the spread height up a lot, we're gonna see a lot more variation because the sampling of pixels has grown and it's applying all that information to each individual raindrop. Next, we have the transfer mode, which is set to lighten by default, but I could change this to composite and then the pixels of these raindrops are not going to blend in to each other or into the background. Lighten will produce rain that looks a lot more natural. And then we have the checkbox composite with original. If I uncheck that, we're going to remove that background photo or whatever we've applied this effect to. And we're seeing this green background because that's what I have in my background here, but I could you know, add a fill effect to that, make it black. And then we can see all of those colors being revealed by the raindrops. Okay, I'm gonna delete this fill effect and I'm gonna reset the rainfall back down to defaults. And finally, we have the extras section. The first option is appearance and it's set to soft solid. But if I change this to refracting and maybe turn the opacity up to 100%, you can see it, especially in this particular raindrop right here. It's making the outside edges of the rain brighter and the interaction with the light is treated differently, which is something you may or may not want. Next up, we have an offset, which is just basically the origin of this particle emitter. So you can shift around the entire emitter, left and right or up and down to position the rain however you want. Next, we have ground level percentage and it's set to 100% by default. But if I back this up, it's basically just a floor. So if I wanted it to look like it was raining, say to that point, that's exactly what this property is gonna let me do. Backing it all the way up to zero, it's gonna cut it right off at the halfway point. I'll set that back up to 100%. And then we have embed depth percent. And you can think of this as a depth cutoff on the Z axis. So if I turn this down, it's going to be trimming off closer and closer to the camera. So if I put it at a percentage of one, then we're just gonna get a single layer of rain right up against the camera, basically. I'll push that back up to 100%. And then finally we have random seed, and this will just randomize the rain. If for some reason you weren't happy with the way that it looked or you needed two copies of this to be different, that's what you'd use the random seed for. All right, well, that was a lot of controls, but that's it for CC Rainfall. I'll turn that off for now, and then I'm gonna search for CC Snowfall and bring that out. Now, this is gonna be very similar to Rainfall, and the controls are gonna be set up very similarly as well. Once again, if I play this back, we have animation. It is kind of hard to see, so I'll zoom in 100% and focus on these darker areas, and you can see those snowflakes falling. Now, once again, just by default, the settings are very convincing to looking like actual snowfall, but we could crank up the flakes value to have a lot more snow. We could increase the size to make it more apparent. We could adjust the variation in size so that we have certain flakes that are much bigger and other ones that are much smaller, or turn the variation all the way down and then every snowflake will be exactly the same size. We have the same scene depth control as in CC Rainfall, which will just compress or expand out that depth. We could increase the speed just like the rain and this will just make it appear like it's a lot heavier snow. Let me undo. Then we have variation percentage in the speed, which just like it sounds gives variation in the speed for every single snowflake. If we take that variation off, then they all fall at a consistent rate. Next up we have wind, just like in the rain. So we can push this snow in a different direction and it'll look more like a blizzard, especially if we increase that speed value. And we also have variation percentage for the wind property. Next up is the spread. So let me set these variations back down to zero and the wind back down, as well as the speed back down, and then take a look at the spread. Once again, this is like the wind variation, except that it's uniform across all of the snowflakes, regardless of what the wind or the speed are set to. So if I turn that all the way down to zero, the snowflakes are gonna fall pretty much straight down. 
but not perfectly straight because of the next category, which is wiggle. And this is where you control how those snowflakes are actually moving around as they're coming down to the ground. So the first value is amount for the wiggle. And if I turn that up, it's very apparent what's happening. These snowflakes are gonna be twisting around, moving back and forth on their way down to the ground. Let me turn that back down to 20% and we have a variation percentage for the amount. So once again, that's going to be a factor of the amount and just introduce a little bit more randomness. I'll undo that and go to the frequency. And this is just like the wiggle expression where you can think of amount as the amplitude and frequency as the frequency. So if you increase this number, they're gonna wiggle many more times per second. So if I say 15, then they're gonna just go crazy back and forth as they're falling down. Next up, we have stochastic wiggle, which is basically determining how these wiggles are happening. And it's a much more complex motion than if we were to uncheck it. You can see that those snowflakes are basically just zigzagging back and forth in a regular wave pattern, basically. So stochastic wiggle is going to give you something that looks a lot more natural. Next up, we have the color. Just like in the rain, we could change this to a bright neon green snowfall if we wanted to. And we could increase the opacity up to 100% or turn it back down if we want it to be less noticeable. I'll undo both of those, collapse wiggle, and then we have background illumination, just like before. The snowflake's opacity can be influenced by the pixels in the layer that it was applied to, as well as how it samples those pixels using the spread width and the spread height. Also, just like CC Rainfall, we have the transfer mode from lighten to composite, as well as the checkbox for composite on original. All right, let's change those back to the way they were. And then finally, we have the extras control, just like before, you can control where that origin point is. You can control the ground level to cut off the snow if you need it to look like it's falling on the ground somewhere. And we have the embed depth to trim off a certain amount of the snowfall on the Z axis. And finally, we have that same random seed to randomize the starting point of the simulation. Let me reset that back down to default and again point out that this effect does a very good job of simulating very light snowfall and with just a couple of tweaks you can get something that looks very convincing. But that's all you need to know about CC Rainfall and CC Snowfall. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this tutorial, then check out the other ones here on my YouTube channel. And if you like my teaching style, then definitely check out my longer form content on Skillshare and School of Motion. And if you want to support more tutorials like this one, check out my Patreon. You can find links for all that stuff in the description of this video.